Well, good morning, everyone. I know it's still morning because we got another minute or two to, to go before noon, but I figured I'd at least uh, launch or uh, uh, start our webinar just to, with a quick intro. Just welcome. We've had people from all over the world attending our, our webinars. Um, and so welcome. Uh, no matter where you are in the world, whether you're China, we have people from Asia, from Australia on here, India, from South America. So uh, no matter where you're attending from, welcome. We'll, we'll give another minute and let a few more people to jump on and uh, then I'll get started. Well, I'll go ahead and get started. Again, welcome. My name is Travis Bowman and uh, I am the, the founder of the Enviro Workshops. Um, <clears throat> the workshops, we've been training environmental professionals around the globe. But in the midst of the pandemic, we found ourselves shifting and launching a new platform called Enviro Class. And uh, this was uh, simply, of course, webinars, uh, which we were not used to doing. We were much more preferred the in-person training. So if you've been to one of our Enviro workshops, you, you'd see um, we typically, of course, are sitting around a table and uh, offering lunch and whether it's a half day or a full day of training. Um, and so things are different. And now, of course, uh, we're all sitting in our office and some of you probably are sitting in your pajamas. But <laughs> what is unique is that we've got people from all over the world that's been uh, jumping on our webinars and that's been uh, incredibly different. So obviously, we're normally going from city to city, whether we have folks that are attending in you know, Denver or Calgary or, or whatever city around the world. But um, so things are a little different, but that's all right. Uh, today's uh, uh, webinar, of course, is focused on the air monitoring. Uh, it's, so it's actually a series. It's uh, two parts, today and tomorrow. Uh, but today we have Eric Swisher from All4 and uh, Brian Fowler from ESC. And so let me, um, I'll go through a little bit more of those details of um, just our company. Well, let's see if I can get my oh, slides moving. Uh, we, uh, like I mentioned about the Enviro workshops, we've hosted uh, close to 400 of them around the globe in 20 countries on six continents. We've seen over 20,000 environmental professionals register. And so we typically would host about 70 workshops a year. And they're not just on air monitoring like today's webinar, but, um, but we do training on remediation, vapor intrusion, wastewater. And so a number of different segments of the market that we do training. Um, globally. And at the end of each of our uh, webinars, we will make sure you get a certificate just like we do in our workshops. And um, our workshops are typically, like I said, a half day or full day. So those are more, you know, four to potentially uh, six uh, cr credit hours. Uh, but today, we'll, uh, it's two credit hours for today's webinar. And you'll get a certificate emailed to you from Faith Woodard, from my team. And one of the things we learned as we shifted in the pandemic is that the engineering boards out there really wanna see uh, that you're answering some polling questions. That's how they know that you're participating. So at the end of today's uh, uh, webinar, we'll actually have just a couple of pre um, uh, questions just for you to answer. And it just, it's our way of knowing that you, it's kind of like a sign in and sign out sheet, just knowing that you, we, you're engaged and you're listening and participating. So, so look for those at the end of today's webinar. The other thing I'll mention is we have on the control panel, and uh, you know, if you look for the handout section, uh, you can download today's program. Again, if we were in your city and your neck of the woods, we'd have a, a nice program printed and a little place to take notes as you're listening to the, the speakers and also just advertisements of the other sponsors that are involved in all the cities we're going to. But obviously we're not in your city and we're, we don't have actual handouts or it's a PDF. So, so uh, take a look at that download the handout uh, for today's webinar. So the other thing that we've done in the midst of the pandemic is we launched a podcast program. So it's called Enviro Talk. And um, we've had a, a number of our sponsors uh, on there uh, just talking about what they're doing in the midst of COVID-19. That's really been our focus, obviously, over the last couple of months. But you know how they're still meeting the needs of their customers. Uh, one of our air monitoring sponsors who'll be speaking tomorrow, they came on the program and talked about the toilet paper shortage. And one of their clients, uh, all of a sudden having plant, you know, shut uh, outages, but yet product supply, you know, it's just, you know, all of a sudden trying to meet the demand and what they're doing in the midst of all that. So anyway, it was quite an entertaining program. You can look for, um, that was Alliance Source uh, uh, testing, so AST. 
uh, look for theirs. But if you go to our website and you can click on EnviroTalk, but you also just wherever you would download your podcast program, just look for EnviroTalk and you can see and listen, uh, listen to that. Well, we have been planning a global environmental summit now uh, for a year, and it's in September, uh, September 1st, 2nd, and 3rd in Charlotte, North Carolina. We will have speakers coming from around the globe. Obviously, uh, some of them might not be flying in. We might be uh, having a virtual presentation from some of them, but we've been working on that, and we are still planning on hosting that right here in Charlotte. I say here because that's where I'm based. Um, but we'll have breakout sessions like you know, like our normal workshops where we'll have some around air quality, wastewater, vapor intrusion, remediation. We've got some great speakers. Our speaker lineup, uh, we've got about 75 speakers in total, and uh, we're, we're just finishing all that. We've had a number of abstracts submitted from all over the country, even around the world. But um, so check out Enviro Summit. It's a completely different website. So take a look at that, and you can see more details there. And in the midst of the COVID-19, we put together a task force leader, and Chris Harden has really uh, uh, championed that. We've been in communication with the governor's office, the, the highest level um, health officials here within the state of North Carolina, and just working with them. We've got a four-page you know, COVID-19 guideline document that we, we drafted and are working with the Mecklenburg County here on all of that. So uh, things we're, we're doing everything in a healthy and safe way. So uh, take a look again at the Enviro Summit, and we'd love to see you there. Well, look for us on LinkedIn. You can see updates uh, on the Enviro Summit on LinkedIn, but also we've got a page uh, just for the Enviro Workshops and our fall schedule will be launching. And so take a look at that on, uh, follow us on LinkedIn there. Well, our first speaker is Eric Swisher. Uh, like I said, he's the technical director for uh, all four and uh, he has over 20 years of the air quality uh, consulting experience. Uh, he possesses a unique combination of skills that link various aspects of air quality management. And he's worked in the emissions testing field, encompassing broad experience with SEMS, uh, with the CEM systems, and is also well versed in the regulatory basis for testing and monitoring. And this experience allows him to bridge the gap between his source permitting requirements and the day to day ex execution of the compliance, monitoring, and testing programs. So you will thoroughly enjoy hearing uh, from Eric. And this is kind of a combined presentation. So Eric and Brian are kind of going back and forth, um, different from some of our other webinars where they're two separate speakers and two separate uh, presentations. They're actually doing a kind of a shared presentation. But Brian Fowler, you can see here, is the Director of Engineering at the Environmental Systems Corporation in Austin, Texas, where he's worked for more than 10 years. Uh, before that, Brian worked as an engineer for Panasonic Automotive Systems. And he graduated from the University of Tennessee with a bachelor's in electrical engineering and an MBA from the College of Business. His skills include program and project management, sales support, and product development. In his free time, Brian enjoys spending time with his wife and two children and watching University of Tennessee football, though I don't think we have a whole lot of that going on, Brian. But go Vols, yes, go Vols. I'm right there with you. Well, like I mentioned, today is part one of our air monitoring series, but take a look at part two. You can see Jordan Lassiter from Alliance Source Testing and also Brian Whitley from EMSI. So both of those are great speakers. They'll be uh, kind of finishing up this uh, air monitoring series tomorrow. Uh, if you're not registered for tomorrow, I highly encourage you to do that so you can kind of complete the whole course um, and if you've paid or not, or what have you, or if you maybe use the discount for today's webinar, use discount code free for tomorrow's webinar. So we make sure that everybody takes advantage of tomorrow's webinar too. So take a look at our website, <clears throat> check, uh, uh, click on uh, part two and register for that one is tomorrow, same time, same bat channel, right? So, um, well, let's see, there you go. That's, uh, that is my introduction and I'm gonna, um, Get Brian and Eric here. Unmute their their microphones. And Brian, I'm going to hand things over to your computer. All right, Eric. I uh, think you're still. Oh, there we go. Got you un unmuted there. All right, great. Well. Uh... Just so from uh, voices here, I'm Eric and uh, Brian is actually going to be, you know, doing the drive in here uh, uh, with respect to the slides and bouncing back and forth between a couple of things that we wanted to show you today. As Travis mentioned, we came off a, a really successful 
uh, all day workshop uh, in the Northeast that we were planning on replicating uh, down kind of in the Gulf Coast area uh, and then travel around other, you know, the other regional areas of the uh, uh, of the country and kind of doing that repeat. And one thing that was really successful about it earlier this year uh, in the Northeast was the, the level of engagement and, and how much of uh, the back and forth that, that we were able to have because we had everybody together, we had everybody together for a full day. So where we had part one and part two, uh, that we were all together in the same room, we were able to go back and forth to uh, you know throw some ideas out bounce some things off of other folks and really have a dialogue inside of, uh, you know, that, you know, that presentation. Uh, that's what Brian and I are going to try to accomplish today. Now he's in uh, Austin, Texas, and I'm up here uh, outside of Philadelphia. So, uh, you know, he's going to be leading some of the, uh, the slides and bouncing back and forth. I might be telling him to go ahead to the next slide or click over here or go back one, whatever. That's just kind of the nature of, of I think, having us both in, in, in different places. Uh, but when we transitioned uh, from what we did up in the Northeast and what we were planning on do down the Gulf Coast, we kind of had to regroup and say, we're not going to have an all-day event. We're not going to have all the parties in the same room together. We're not going to have the level of you know face-to-face -face engagement with the audience. So what do we do? because uh, we wanted to be in contribution because that's what these times are all about. And that's one of the things that, uh, you know, that, that we, you know, as all four, and I, I can speak to ESC as well here is, is what can we put out there to be in contribution during these times? Uh, what are people planning for? What are people wanting to hear about? And how can we provide them value uh, during something like this? And, a little bit shorter amount of time and, and kind of can we package it up, uh, you know, and, and deliver it uh, in, a, in, you know, in a webinar based, based format in a, in a certain amount of time. So what we decided to do, and this is a little bit different than what we did earlier in the year, is we started to kind of focus and uh, focus on some flare monitoring and the data, specifically around the data management challenges. And we, we decided to do that one because we got kind of a wave that is you know you know started and is is kind of moving and some spots have is as completed uh in the refining sector so these guys are doing it and they're really becoming comfortable with how they are doing what they are doing and they're learning a heck of a lot now we've got other uh flare monitoring challenges uh with uh, the ethylene mac with with ma and old those other monitoring uh flare monitoring challenges that are really you know pointing back to what the refining sector did so we decided to go ahead and, and, and explore some of those things that that we've seen in the refining sector uh that will be generally applicable or not exactly uh you know applicable to uh those of you who may be starting this process and just start to show some of the things that uh, you know, even we learned and we started and where we are now and kind of how we got there. Uh, so I, we'll, we'll go ahead and explore that and unpack that a little bit. Uh, before we start, Brian, I just want to get an okay that, that you can, that we can hear you and you can hear us and you're ready to go on the slides. Hey, Eric, I, I believe you can. Can you hear me all right now? Sure can. All right. Excellent. So, hey, go ahead. We ready to roll? Are you ready to go? I'm driving. Here we go. Excellent. All right. So we want to hit the next slide there. There we go. Okay. So if we just look at what we're trying to do, what are some indicators of good flare performance, right? You, we can drill it down into some pretty simple things, that, although they do get more complicated when you start moving back to, oh, great, I got some indicators. Well, how do I monitor those indicators? How do I calculate those indicators? How do I evaluate those indicators against a, an operational limitation? All those things, but all in all, basically we're trying to operate a flare with no visible emissions, no smoking, with good combustion efficiency and good uh, uh, destruction, destruction and removal efficiency. And where com combustion efficiency is, you know, that's kind of the measurement of, of uh, uh, you know, how much of the hydrocarbon is being, you know, combusted or burned and yielding 
CO2, carbon dioxide, and water vapor. Whereas destruction efficiency is kind of the measure of the hydrocarbon being destroyed. So there are they are different, but there is a relationship. The relationship is the combustion efficiency will most always you know be less than or equal to the destruction efficiency. And you know there is a you know an assumption or some literature that would support uh, a pretty you know a reproducible relationship between combustion efficiency. So if I have a destruction efficiency of 98%, then I would have a combustion efficiency of 96.5%. So you can see there is a relationship. This is kind of what we are after and uh, what we're trying to accomplish, whether it be in the refining sector, the chemical sector. Uh, or any of the other, you know, new rules that are coming out here that are incorporating the Max CC uh, flare monitoring approaches. So, well, how do we monitor these? What do we need to look at? And again, we're we're pretty simple here. We got a nice little tight little, uh, uh, you know, uh, package. However, now we will explore how these things kind of expand. But really, we're looking at a pilot flame. You know, we want to make sure that we have, uh, uh, you know, the presence of a pilot flame because without the pilot flame, we're not going to have that combustion occurring if we do have a, you know, a release to the flare. We're also looking at the combustion zone net heating value. And the combustion zone net heating value is what is the heating value at the combustion zone of the material that's going through? The tip velocity. And that's the amount of velocity that's going through the tip. And we're just gonna we're just gonna be real simple here. We're gonna look at the you know the regular candlestick type you know flares. How much velocity is going out through the the flare tip? And then we're also monitoring visible emissions. Okay, so we we got several different options there for monitoring visible emissions. So we're gonna really explore kind of the net heating value, the tip velocity, touch on the visible emission. And for the pilot flame, you know, we'll, we'll just kind of, you know, do a cursory review of that, but not get too much in, uh, uh, into detail there. So now we're going to go to this next slide, which we, oh, it worked. We were having problems with some of this animation, but it uh, looks like we got it figured out. So if we look at kind of some of the flare monitoring, uh, you know, uh, aspects here, so we have a flare and we've got pilot, a uh, pilot flame, uh, and we've got gas going to that pilot flame at the tip. We're going to have a flare gas coming to it, and we're going to have a supplemental gas. So uh, we're going to be combusting a, a flare vent gas, and we're going to have to have some sort of supplemental gas to make up the heat content uh, during periods of, of various uh, flaring events or various operations to make sure that we're able to elevate that uh, uh, you know combustion zone heating value to where we can meet those destruction and and uh, combustion efficiency uh you know minimum uh you know construction uh or combustion and destruction efficiency uh requirements so if we look at kind of what the monitoring that we have available to us from a pilot flame you know people are using thermocouples you know ultraviolet flame detectors or infrared monitors is there a presence of the pilot flame? There has been some little tweaks in the ethylene MAC and others that talk about flame presence versus pilot flame. But at the end of the day, what we need to make sure is that we have we have something that's burning up there. So when we go ahead and send uh, you know gas up there, the, the combustion uh, can occur. I'm going to go ahead and click next. There you got the infrared aspect for the. Uh, thermocouples and the infrared. Now, if we look at kind of the visible emissions, we're looking at visible emissions as also as an indicator of performance. And how we do that is what well, we can take, put our eyeball on it and do a method 22 and determine whether or not do we have uh, visible emissions or we could utilize uh, you know, an optional you know, visible emissions camera, camera or surveillance camera, something that we're looking at, something that we're monitoring to determine if there's a presence of visible emissions. The, the next aspect of uh, you know, the flare monitoring is, okay, well, how do we control some of those that smoking that could occur? Well, we have options. We have steam-assisted flare. We have air-assisted flares. Uh, both of those are designed to kind of quench and kind of um, you know, prevent 
you know, or help with this, that smoking aspect. So it's kind of a, a means to when we see, uh, uh, you know, visible emissions that we have something that we can adjust to kind of, you know, you know, alleviate or make those go away. However, we put too much steam or too much air at the combustion zone, we're going to start to take away or dilute and influence the, uh, the, the heat content that's coming in from the flare, the flare gas. So uh, the flare vent, uh, you know, gas header. So we've got to kind of balance these things and we start monitoring these flows. So we got to monitor the air assist flow. If you have an air assist, you got to monitor the steam assist flow. Again, we're doing that because we got to account for, uh, you know, that dilution that's happening, you know, at that combustion zone. Also, we're looking at, we have to know the vent gas. So how much of the vent gas is coming from the flare header to the, uh, uh, you know, to the flare, as well as the supplemental gas. How much supplemental gas are, is coming to the, uh, uh, you know, the flare, the, the, the flare as well. Now that supplemental gas could be put in upstream of the vent gas flow monitor. There's various different places and configurations, but we need to account for all these things. In addition, we need to account for the net heating value of the gas going to the flare, all right? And that would be a combination of the supplemental gas or the vent gas flow monitor. There's various different ways that you can do that. You can do a grab sample, so you're not doing anything continuous. You're, you could use a calorimeter. A calorimeter is basically just taking and analyzing the entire sample. It's not doing any speciation. It's not doing any individual components. It's just taking and determining a BTU per, per volume of gas that's being sent to the flare. Or we could be using things like a gas chromatograph or a mass spectrometer. And we're gonna get into, into those a little bit more different because they do impact how, um, you know, how our data handling occurs. Uh, because of some of the artifacts of utilizing a more continuous uh, monitor that has a promulgated performance specification that would be applicable to both the GC and the mass spec. And you can see the net heating monitor, uh, you know, being brought to the table there. So, okay, so we're going to kind of go through and kind of, uh, uh, you know, run through various different things here. But first, a couple nuances here. It's very important to understand the system objective, okay? We have a relationship between process control and environmental compliance. They're not, they're not necessarily one and the same. The objective of flare monitoring may be, more, may be for process control so that we can be in environmental compliance. So when you develop systems, and we're going to show you kind of what some of those systems can look like, they can work together or independently. I may have a system that's solely designed to control the flares, increase, decrease steam, increase, decrease supplemental gas, and then have another system that's solely responsible for the environmental compliance. I'm making the uh, determination whether or not you are in or out of environmental compliance. Now those, pe those pieces overlap because the one thing that we, we really don't want to do and uh, we've had, uh, you know, we've let, learned some lessons on, on this is that we have to calculate your environmental compliance in one place. You only have one answer. Are you in or out? If you're calculating things and in multiple, multiple places, now you start to get discrepancies. So you may have kind of a hybrid where the process control is doing certain things a certain way, maybe doing it in a little more conservative nature, maybe on a shorter frequency because it's trying to catch up with the flare and then catch up with operations. And environmental compliance is there just turning the data that's coming into it and then giving feedback to operations and maybe even some feedback into that process control loop to say, hey, here's where I am and here's where I may be if we continue this way. 
with respect to your environmental compliance. So it's very important to understand that these systems don't are not necessarily the same. They can be separate depending on the objective and depending on what you're trying to accomplish as you go through and implement a flare monitoring system, uh, not just the monitoring, but also the data handling. Another aspect is this, okay, is we have to really uh, start to unwind not just data values and not just timestamp data values and not just timestamp data values that have a certain unit, but now I've got to know my process code. Do I have regulated material going to the flare? Because if you look at a lot of the flare monitoring requirements, it says you must meet these requirements when regulated material is going to the flares. For some folks, you always have regulated material going to the flare, no big deal. For others, you may have a flare gas recovery system and you are, at, you are not sending things to the flares. So you are subject to those flare monitoring requirements when you've got regulated material going to the flare. So knowing when that is, easy for me to put it on the slide, very complicated when you start to figure out how do I determine the regulated material going to the flare. Is it something as simple as a water seal breakage if you have you know, a knockout drum or flare gas recovery? Could be. Sometimes you find that that in and above itself is not enough. You may have to look at other parameters, maybe flow, maybe composition, uh, maybe various different uh, you know, pressures you know, at different places throughout the system to determine when regulated materials go into the flare. That's important. So we're building out this you know, monitoring and, and, and process status that we need to be able to determine when we're subject to monitoring, when we're subject to emission standards. Could be easy for some, a little more complicated for others. Also, we need to know the status of our monitoring equipment, okay? Where here, if we are in validation or in maintenance mode or out of control, now we don't have that means to demonstrate compliance. We don't have, uh, we can't use that data for demonstrated compliance. And that gets really tricky when I'm tying things back from a process control standpoint. So from an environmental perspective, I may have out of control data or I may have data which is not representative because I'm in calibration or I'm in maintenance or I'm in validation. I can't control process based on that information. So I've got to make sure that I understand these differences and understand what I'm doing, what my objective is, because from a regulatory thing, I might be trying to accomplish one thing, and from a process controls, I'm trying to accomplish something else. And there is an overlap, okay? So what we're gonna do is kind of just jump into some of these uh, 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 different, you know, uh, you know, parameters, and and this is what you'll see, and we're gonna see how good Brian's gonna be, uh, you know, following along with kind of showing you some of the things that you know, and it, it looks real simple in some aspects, but some of the areas of and some of the determinations that were made in a system, right? And this just this is you know ESC's uh, stack vision system, but regardless what system it is, it's got to be have certain basic functionalities to determine certain things. And here, what we've done is we've established different parameters that allow to tell us when flare on and flare on regulated material going to the flare. That's the, that's the description, that's the terminology that was chosen here, that we have regulated material going to the flare. Okay, now I got to worry about, or now I got to, you know, subject to monitoring, now I got to start quantifying against my uh, indicators of, of flare performance and such. Also, I just threw this one in here because I don't want to necessarily talk a whole bunch about it, but status of the pilot flame, right? Here you just see a one, one's good, zero's bad. Well, there's a lot behind that one, right? What, do, what all do we need to evaluate between multiple different thermocouples, multiple different infrared detectors to get that one to where it is? We may be evaluating a bunch of different things. Very simple here, looks like one's good, zero's bad. 
but there's a lot of things behind the scenes. And this is where these things kind of play. This is where these systems can play together from the stack vision, which is more geared towards uh, you know, the environmental side. It's looking probably from a, a DCS or a control system to provide it some of these information. So it's providing it a status of the flares, yes or no, uh, from a regulatory, from a regulated material perspective. It's providing it a yes or no from the pilot uh, flame status perspective. So things are kind of you know overlapping a little bit and, and, and playing together uh, inside of those two uh, you know worlds. So now I'm going to jump back into the presentation. Right on perfect slide. So let's just start looking at what some of the stuff is that we need to determine. If we did, we said a, a great indicator of, of flare performance is the combustion zone, uh, you know, uh, net heating value. So it's a net heating value of the combustion zone, not of the gas, of the combustion zone. So in order to do that, we've got to know the net heating value of the vent gas. That is the net heating value of the of the gas going to the flare, and that could include the supplemental gas. It could include the uh, uh, or will include the supplemental gas. Will include the uh, uh, you know the vent gas you know going to the flare. And there's different ways we can we can get there and quantify that, but we need to know what's the heating value of the gas going to the flare. Also, we need to know how much. What's the volume of that gas going to the flare? But now we have another thing. We have these influences or diluters. We've got these. We've got these other things: steam assist, air assist, depending on types of flares that you're that you're operating, that could impact the performance or impact the net heating value of the combustion zone. So we've got to kind of take a look at those. So I think Brian, we're going to jump back into the next one. Okay, so as you can see here, here's kind of the relationships. Hey, I only want NHV of the combustion zone. How hard can that be? Well, as we start moving back forward, moving back towards the, the source, we start to say, well, I need the NHV of the vent gas. Well, in order to get the NHV of the vent gas, in this case, I'm monitoring the NHV of all the individual components that are going into uh, the flare. I also need to know the different flows. I need to know the flows from the uh, to the flare, from the vent gas. I need to know the different steams. And I might have different, you know, it might just might not be one steam flow meter that I'm measuring. I may need to have to measure different steams depending on where we're administering that steam. And then I also need to know any uh, the, the flows of any 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 inerts, uh, the flow of any. Uh, uh, you know, natural gas or anything I'm using from a supplemental perspective. And you can see, looking back from kind of this design diagram uh, that, you know, that, that built into the system here is we're starting to expand. We're starting to going back, starting with our angle and moving back into something that's a little more complicated uh, with respect to, uh, uh, you know, what we're trying to accomplish. So we're going to jump back into the presentation since Brian's been so seamless at that. Now, just as from an operational limitation, what we need to accomplish from a, from a, a combustion zone uh, uh, net heating values, we have to be greater than 270 uh, uh, BTU per scuff on a 15 minute block uh, basis when regulated material is going, is routed to the flare for at least 15 minutes. All right, so that's the regulatory requirements, that's the operational uh, limitation. Next slide there, Brian. Okay, so now let's on that's unpack, you know, what the each individual component is, because this is where it gets fun, right? Is we need to know the net heating value of the vent gas. Simple enough. So we need to know the net heating value of the gas going to the flare prior to any influences or any influences or diluters being brought to the party. So we need to measure that. That's a monitoring requirement. So what does that look like? Jump to the next slide there, Brian. Here we go. Excellent. So you have some options. You know, you can, uh, 
you know, do a grab sample like like I mentioned. Um, and we're going to just, you know, we'll, you'll see that down at the bottom of the chart. But for the most part, you have different ways of getting there. You can measure individual components and the concentration of those components and then multiply those by the heat content and roll it into a overall net heating value. So you're basically, you know, taking each individual component that you are looking for and even the ones you're not looking for, you're accounting for them and you're rolling them into, you know, using a published heat uh, heating value, which is part of, you know, uh, uh, part C, uh, you know, sub part CC and you're rolling it into a net heating value. You could also take a grab sample, you know, during these periods, but for the most part, you know, you're, you're doing the same thing, but a monitoring system just continuous. Uh, you're getting a lot more data uh, and it's uh, subject to, you know, some other monitoring requirements, which we're gonna get into uh, other, you know, quality assurance requirements that we're gonna get into next. We could also on the other side, not care about the individual components. So we don't care to know what each individual component is going to the flare. We just want to know the heat content. And that's where you can utilize a calorimeter. And a calorimeter is, uh, you know, well, we'll just give you the BTU per scuff that is going to the flare. Whereas the other monitoring systems, GCs, mass specs, even the grab sample are going to give you each individual component and then you do some calculations to get to that 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 value gives you a little more granularity on that on, on the uh, or transparency on you know what you have going to your flare okay so if we start looking now at the individual component monitoring system so let's let's say we're we're where we have a calorimeter or we didn't choose to use a calorimeter. We wanted to go down a road. We wanted individual components. Why? Because they're important. We need to know, it's good for us to know the individual components because it helps us make decisions. Where's that flaring event coming from? Uh, what are the constituents of, be, be due to the constituents of you know the, the vent gas? It's actually a process tool. Um, so we're utilizing those individual components for reasons that may not be necessarily just for the net heating value. We have other benefits for those. So we went ahead and said, you know what, we're going to do that. We're going to utilize gas chromatography. So we're using a GC. That's a way to do speciation to get individual components. However, GCs don't give you that real-time feedback. You know, you're doing an injection once every five, seven minutes. And when you're trying to catch up with something on a 15-minute block basis, it becomes complicated to, you know, uh, to utilize data and not know where you are at any given time so you can make those adjustments. So maybe a gas chromatograph, because the variability isn't, you know, in, in the gas stream isn't, isn't good enough. So I need to go to something more real time, but I still want the speciation. So now I can, maybe I go to that mass spec. Now the mass spec was approved for max cc under an alter a broadly applicable uh, a broadly approved alternative uh you know monitoring uh you know petition so it's been accepted it's been approved for use for the refining sector it's been written into the rules for ethylene mac old mon so it's actually been incorporated so now it's part of this uh, of your of your options what happens though is as we start getting into these individual components, and as we start getting into these, uh, you know, GCs and mass specs, we're also opening ourselves up, and we're starting to get into quality assurance activities, quality assurance activities that are required specifically by a performance specification. In this case, performance specification nine, which which uh, actually is the is initially and does the initial and ongoing quality assurance activities so if you want to go to the next slide brian here's what they are and we could do a whole training on the quality assurance uh quality control aspects of ps9 as they're applicable to gc and mass specs 
but remember what we're what, what overall what our goal is for today is we want to we want to start to to really appreciate how these tests when we do them affect data how they could affect data and what do we need to do to handle those scenarios because if process controls maybe we're looking for one thing but now with ps9 i'm bringing a whole bunch of regulatory requirements that i need to bring that validate that data so now i have to do valuations so we're here we have we have various different uh you know quality assurance aspects and i wouldn't I don't want to gloss over these because they are important. And early on in the refining sector, these were things that even required EPA to put out a frequently asked questions regarding PS9 because of all the uncertainty around it. And some of the main points, although this is more of a quality assurance activity, but for those just starting out, is PS9 is required. It stands on its own. It most likely doesn't correspond exactly with anything you're doing with the HRVOC role in some part in some parts of Texas or uh, a consent decree, typically they reference certain parts of PS9, but maybe not all of PS9. So be very careful where you think you may be with respect to quality assurance activities, and also very important in things that really took a, a, a you know uh, something that we had to uh, uh, you know pivot during the implementation process is specifically where the, the places of the gases get injected for the quality assurance activities and just note that the performance audit test needs to go to the probe whereas the other tests can go directly to the back of the analyzer the reason that's important is because it could affect design could affect configuration changes uh, so you have the ability to put those gases to the probe versus to the back of the analyzer. So enough on that. We're going to go through an example on a multi-point validation to show you kind of what it all entails. Why? Not necessarily because you know we want to talk about the quality assurance activities, but this is what you need to do. But what do we need to be able to accomplish? So here we're doing a multi-point calibration validation. It kind of depends on how we're using it, if we're actually calibrating or validating. So basically, we have a curve, a calibration curve, and we're doing low, mid, high, low, mid, high, low, mid, high, low, mid, high. What we need to do is we need to evaluate those. Now, we need to evaluate those. It's not just a pass fail. We just don't put them in and do a quick comparison and say, yeah, we're good. No, we're not. We have a multi step process for doing this. Uh, you know, you know, uh, comparison or or doing this uh, pass fail uh, criteria. First, I have triplicate injections, and triplicate injections, which is required for the multi-point calibration, has to first go through. I can't deviate by more five percent of the average. So I have three. I have an average of those three. Each one of those can't be within five percent of the average. Step one. Step two, I need those, you know, each of that, that average has to be within 10% of the value of the cylinder gas. All right. And just note, I'm doing this on NHV. I'm going to talk a little bit about that later, uh, you know, briefly is I'm not using individual components, which you may have to, depending on, you know, what your uh, compliance solution is, but we are evaluating that on individual components. So, I've got the five, the precision, the five percent. I get the average. I've got the uh, ten percent uh, of the cylinder gas bottle, and then I've got a third comparison. My line has got to be straight, and it's got to have an R squared value greater than 0.995. So those are the three things that I evaluate when I do a multi-point, uh, you know, calibration validation. Why is this important? Because it could trigger good data to be bad data. So when I am in calibration, that might be easy to determine because the mass spec or the GC is sending me something saying, hey, I'm in calibration. So from a process control standpoint or from your compliance solution, 
it might be or compliance engine it might be oh easy i'm in calibration i can just ignore that data you're not done yet we've got to evaluate the success of that validation and for mass specs and gcs for flare monitoring it's a lot more complicated so here's something you can see is is a uh, uh we just put some screenshots out of out of the you know the uh, stack vision system just because it's easier you can see the low mid and high injections and then you can see the the error limit you can see the the, the status the pass fail status and then on the next slide you can see the evaluation in the report where you go through you have your you know your gases your precision your error limit and then at the bottom your r squared so this is actually allowing us to evaluate and trigger the next step passing's great but if i fail i'm out of control if i'm out of control i've got things i need to do to get back in control and also i've got to consider uh you know how i'm doing my monitoring what am i doing for process controls at that point if i have data that is out of control but at the but but you are from a regulatory perspective being driven to take action that's going to take your monitoring system further offline and further away from it being able to provide you any information all right okay so now what that looks like and this is you know kind of during this period and we just we pulled one up here for the nhv where you had a you know a, a daily we we went ahead and did a daily validation okay what that looks like on the minute basis look at data lab there is you can see that door on the minute basis we know that by these flags see how these flags are c and the data is invalid that it's giving us a signal and it's saying that hey i'm in calibration i'm going through calibration that's a good thing that's an easier thing because we're being told most likely from a gc we're being told from an aspect that we're in calibration evaluating the calibration results is a little bit more trickier so here we we actually went ahead and passed the calibration so we're good to go right so we just have to come up with a solution to account for that data during the calibration where we're offline from a process controls perspective but from a compliance perspective from a monitoring perspective we have you know we've we've met our uh, quality assurance activities associated with uh, the GC and the mass spec. If you go to the next tab, here's how it looks like on the 15 minute basis. So now you have a 15 minute basis that's actually rolled up where you would have, you know, some downtime associated with uh, that calibration because that calibration occurred over, you know, uh, several 15 minute periods. Now, if we look at the, the next Cal Lab example, uh oh. We failed. All right. So here we went through a validation and we failed. And we, we, we know we failed because we're, we actually got something that's evaluating that pass fail tolerance for us and saying, oh, uh oh, we failed. So now if we go in the data lab and look at that, you can see that in here, the, the unit did, wasn't having regulated material because you can see by the F, uh, the F flag there. But regardless of ignore the F flag, we were in calibration. We're in calibration, our data is invalid. We can't use it for anything just like it was before. But notice what happens as soon as we fail. We're out of control. And you can see the out of control flag, uh, you know, come in as the T. And then also the, the uh, uh, out of control uh, checkbox being clicked. That's important because now our calibration, the analyzer is giving the signal saying that, hey, that calibration has ended. You can see here where it goes, the C goes away because that's being told to us that it's gone. But we're still out of control from a regulatory perspective because we failed. Now we've got to notify, now we've got to take ac actions. And that actions is not only to get the analyzer back online, see how we here, we went through and did another calibration, as you can see, and then returned it to service. And you will see when the after the C goes away, we do have we'll come back to having uh, you know you know valid data. So it's very important to understand and to distinguish between 
in calibration and the ability to evaluate calibration from a data side. One, because we have to take action, and then two, because we have to uh, uh, also report that, report it, record that. There's under uh, a lot of, there are, there are some differences in the record keeping reporting, but really downtime is not something that is a reportable under uh, Max CC, but it is something we need to know. We need to quantify, we need to be able to record those periods. And here, the ability to distinguish those allows the reason and action code, which again is just the, the means that we're using here to quantify the why and what we did, so that eventually when we, when we uh, go through and generate a report uh, for record keeping purposes, for understanding what my, our downtime was for the NHV, it is you know, in that RSR downtime events duration, which is the, the next one. You can see here's that downtime event that occurred and there's the reason and the action for it. Now, during this period, we've got to come up with something from a process control standpoint. Because from a process control standpoint, we're flying blind because we don't have any good data. What do you do? There's the separation. What can you do? What do you have available to you? You know, holding the last value. Uh, you know, there's certain things from a process control that you may consider that really don't play into the environmental stuff because you don't have that data available to you. Okay. And then we'll jump back into the uh, presentation. Okay, notice that, that I was talking about the use of NHV in place of a component. If you are only driven by the, the flare monitoring requirements that reference back to MACCC, you do have an option to use a surrogate cal calibration, which you don't have to look for every component. You can just look for a subset of the components. And you don't have to do your daily validation uh, pass-fail tolerance on every individual component. You only have to do it on the total NHV value. So it's the result of all those individual components. That may be different for some of you guys that have consent decrees or some of you guys that have different uh, you know, state monitoring or local, local monitoring requirements that you may, may have to continue to uh, quality assure individual components. That being said, you still want to evaluate individual components because you don't want your NHB value to get so out of whack that it, that, that, that cause a problem, you know, down the road from each individual, you know, by not paying attention to each individual component. The way this NHV calculation, you know, looks like is what we're doing, and this is for if I have a surrogate calculation, uh, cal calibration, I'm only looking for hydrogen, methane, ethane, propane, butanes, and, and pentanes, right? And I'm utilizing published values in table 12 of MACCC. So I'm using those values, but notice the hydrogen one we have highlighted here, it's not the scientific BTU per scuff value for, I think that's 273 or something like that. Just because they, you know, hydrogen, if you're burning just hydrogen, they you know, really, they don't want to have to supplement burning just hydrogen with natural gas to get above uh, the uh, uh, the net heating value of the combustion zone. Could you go back to that last slide, Brian? Because uh, there's another thing here that I wanted to, uh, wanted to point out is that this calculation can occur various places. And we're talking about data and we're talking about calculations. It's very nice to have everything in one place that's transparent, that you can go see it. But this can be done at the GC level or at the mass spec level. So you can actually put this equation in the mass spec, put this equation in the GC and it'll spit it out. Just keep in mind that it becomes less transparent less accessible, and you really have to start expanding your uh, your box of review because whereas maybe you're looking at a calculation methodology, a system, now you're looking at individual analyzers and components to maintain 
that one, they're correct initially, and then the management the management of change is appropriate so none of this stuff gets changed because your system that you may be using could be just assuming that these calculations are being done correctly. So it's very important to understand where it's happening and then understand is it transparent and how do I get my hands on it if I need it and who else can get their hands on it. And I think we can, we're gonna go back and just show kind of what that, yeah, so here, basically all the uh, the NHV calculation is done inside of the system and the calculation is basically you know transparent uh, here as shown um, you know in this design document that's uh, you know it just part of the configuration so it's actually you know the real calculation that's occurring is what you see here so it's very transparent uh, you know in that nature. All right, so jump back into the slide. All right, so the other part that we have to start looking at, as we talked about, we have, we, we're focusing on the combustion zone. We talked about the vent, the, the vent gas and the complications. And, and the complications around the vent gas are similar, you know, or we can, we can build on those basically is probably a better way to put it for the volumetric flow determinations. When we're talking about volumetric flows, we're talking about, volumetric flow of the vent gas, and then any of the influences of the diluters. So on the next slide, if we look at kind of what the, the vent gas flow, the steam assist or the air assist, whatever we're looking at, the vent gas could include supplemental you know, gases, things like that. There's a couple of things that we've got to consider. Is first, minimum accuracy requirements, especially if you have low molecular weight. You really need to consider the technology that you are using to ensure is the right technology to meet the minimum ac accuracy requirements. Again, that's a system design issue. Doesn't really impact data, other than the fact that your data is not going to look very, you know, may not look all that representative and may not be, you know, close to what you expect to see because it's just inaccurate. So, or doesn't have the ability to measure at the range of operation that you may need these, these flow monitors to perform. Also, you have limited quality assurance tests. So where you still are going to have quality assurance tests, you are not necessarily going to be doing something every single day like a, like a validation or a calibration that's going to impact the good-bad. So when you're not doing the quality tests at a frequent, at a frequent basis, you are not going to fail anything you don't do. So it becomes a little bit less of, a, of an issue with the, with the flow monitoring systems because of what they're designed to do, how their quality is assured, and what you do ongoing. There's not, not, they're not completely you know, exempt from the quality assurance you know, testing. There are but they're at a lot much longer frequency and when you're doing it you're going to have someone doing it and they're going to pass it, they're going to put it back on, and then it's going to be evaluated the next time those, you know, uh, uh, biennial or, you know, other tests, you know, come into play. We still need to be concerned about data quality stats, right? Because we still have faults. We still have maybe maybe some maintenance events that we need to occur uh, on, the, on the, we still need to, you know, track, you know, is this data in fault? Or is this data from the analyzer giving me, uh, you know, is it happy? You know, is it healthy? Uh, am I doing maintenance on it? So we're still going to have some data quality status. It's just not going to, a lot of it's not going to be around the quality assurance aspect. We're real, we're going to have ancillary systems. We're going to have ancillary systems and pressure systems that, that are for temperature and pressure that are, you know, to, to get things in standard conditions. The units of standard cubic feet. These, this most likely is going to be coming from the analyzer. So what temperature and pressure is it standardizing to? And it confirming that it is actually standard and not actual. So all those things, like I said, we're, we're, if, we're, if we're depending on calculations to happen anywhere other than you know, uh, your, your compliance solution or your or process control solution, we've got to get further in the weeds on how that analyzer is, 
is operating and what calculations are being done inside of that analyzer and are they consistent with the regulatory basis you know, are they using the right standard temperature and pressure is the standard actually standard not temperature things like that also we have to look at these volumetric flows as cumulative over a 15 minute clock quadrant so how are we going to do cumulative are we going to do a totalizer maybe it starts over every 15 minutes or are we going to use a flow rate and time i mean a totalizer if you think about it, what we're trying to accomplish here is from a process control standpoint totalizer may not serve you well if it starts at zero at the beginning of every 15 minute you know uh, clock quadrant a flow rate where you are taking that flow rate and you're assuming that flow rate is going to be you know over that 15 minute period could serve you well from a process control standpoint and then that average flow rate would change throughout the 15 minute 15 minute period so those little areas of how even how you sum things up and how you provide the cumulative and how you are you know uh you know considering those things have different impacts depending on the type of system and what the, the ultimate goal uh, or the objective of each system and is, is is going to do so we're going to bounce back into and you are doing a fantastic job bouncing back and forth brian i do have to say um like for example here is here we have flow that's coming into the flare in the units of standard cubic feet per hour it's coming from the monitor first of all we've got to verify that it and there's also the mechanism here to be even more transparent and we kind of like to do this as well is just give me the temperature give me the pressure give me the actual let me do the calculation you know inside the system because it builds transparency but here what we're doing is we're bringing in a rate standard cubic foot per hour then we're taking that and we're dividing it by 60 to get standard cubic feet per minute then we're multiplying it by the, the time regulated materials coming into the flare to get the, the cumulative flow over the 15 minutes so we're doing it a little bit different way than trying to totalize and starting at zero and build up but we're getting to the same point but we're always having data available to us throughout that because we're doing a rate that rate approach All right. So we're building on, you know, the uh, uh, the use of, you know, the the flow monitors of, from a data side. From we still have to worry about some of the same things we did from that heating value, but not as much because of the quality assurance activities. But now I think we'll bounce back into the uh, into the into the slide deck. All right. So. If you go back up one, Brian. Sorry, go back or down one more one. Oop. Just as we kind of just gave you a compliment on that. Well, you know, technology now is <laughs> always so Give me a second here. Uh, so, uh, automation slides for some reason don't seem to work. Sorry, I can't get it. It won't come up. It's your lovely picture. Maybe I can do this. Okay. There you go. All <laughs> right. So thank you. Now, see, that is pivoting. That is improvising. Um, <laughs> so we're moving away from the net heating value, but what we're now we're looking at is that flare tip velocity. All right. And what this flare tip velocity is another parameter for good indication of, uh, you know, operation of flare. And what we're trying to prevent is this flare lift off, right? is we don't want to push so much stuff through the through the flare and it uh, the the picture is supposed to depict a flame actually lifting off the top of the flare uh but you know take my word for it is the more velocity oh real time the more velocity that we have going through the flare tip we could push that flat push that flame off the top of the flare that creates problems with you know performance of the flare so we have to we have to uh determine and we have to measure uh the tip velocity to make sure that we are not exceeding uh the the performance uh requirements associated with proper operation and if we go now to that next slide 
was um, for some reason we have a slide that wasn't coming up. What we're doing is we're comparing that against a, a static number of 400 feet per second or a maximum allowable flare tip velocity of Vmax. And the Vmax, you look at the calculation, is this is a limit now, is set based on the composition of the vent gas. So just keep that in mind is now we're bringing even for a, 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 a limit for VTIP, we're bringing something to the party that has quality assurance activities, which means it's going to go offline from time to time. We're not going to have that data. So what happens to VMAX during those periods? What are we doing? Are we just being subject to the 400? Or are we holding a value? What are we doing there? So you can see that all this stuff from a process control standpoint, and even from an environmental compliance standpoint, you have to start figuring out what all could impact these different uh, uh, these different parameters going into the operational limitations here for for VTIP. Okay. So on the VTIP. So when we're monitoring VTIP, what are we looking at? Well, we're looking at the velocities of the vent gas and the supplemental gases we're basically taking what could be going through that flare that could lift the flame off the uh, uh, you know off the top right How, what you know what could we be doing to cause that uh, that uh, flame flare uh, lift off if you will and you know other than you know the the flow rates all, everything else is you know engineering you know it's an unobstructive area and conversion factors but what does that cumulative flow uh look like so brian i think we're going to bounce back into the so here on the v-tip you can see if we're, we kind of went through kind of the, the backwards, we've got the VTIP parameter. What's all going into it? Well, it's the flows. And the flows are comprised of, uh, you know, uh, if you look at the flow for the uh, the vent gas, it's actually, so, so you know, uh, you know, the supplemental there's Brian's on the blue and supplemental is the supplemental gas. And then the flow for the, for the flare is the flow for the flare, you know, that includes, um, you know, other parameters associated with that. So you see how we keep going backwards into quantifying all those different, all those different flow rates. So the other part of it, and we're kind of piecing and we're building here. So I didn't, we didn't necessarily, this, didn't go throw and show this for NHV combustion zone, but we're just going to show it to you for VTIP because this is another aspect of data management, data handling is I need to know when I have an issue. And I may be using process controls to control the flare to prevent an issue. And my environmental engine may be working in the background to ensure none, none happens. But if it does, I'm going to let you know about it because it's something that we need to report as a deviation. So here is just an alarm. So basically we had a situation in this, in this uh, demo uh, set that we've exceeded the, the, the flare tip uh, velocity, right? So as that, that, what that looks like in data lab, the next data lab up, is it tags it as an exceedance. So alarm lets us know it tags us as an exceedance and it also provides us the opportunity to put a reason and action code in. Why? Because we need to report this stuff and we need to know why it happened and what we did. Also gives us the ability to scroll over to the right to be able to put, you know, we have to be able to define what happened, you know, and that's an incomplete entry. We had probably put what it failed, what we did to fix it, all that kind of stuff can kind of put into that, um, you know, into that overall comment. But we're pulling together now from a data side, the data has got to be constructed and calculated in a manner that we're confident when it alarms us that we need to take action and we need to take action with reporting uh, from a process side. We also need to take action from an environmental side. And then that rolls into kind of an exceedance or a deviation report. 
And that deviation report would just be, hey, during this time period, we had an exceedance, the start time, the end time, and here's the reason and action code, and you know, or the reasons that it happened, and here's what we did, and here's the comments that kind of support, you know, kind of those actions that we're taking during that period. So you can see, regardless of what we're monitoring, we need to be able to, to evaluate that compliance status and be able to report on it. All right. So remember, we identified, you know, the net heating value, the VTIP, uh, also visible emissions. Now, from a data perspective, the visible emissions are a little bit trickier because majority of folks are utilizing the option for a surveillance camera, right? And that surveillance camera is looking for our operational limitation is no visible emissions. Now they do have an exception and you're allowed, uh, you know, uh, five minutes in any two consecutive hours. But the way that we're doing that with a visible emissions, we may have a camera on it, but we still may need to manually interject to determine whether or not we have a uh, you know reportable or visible missions that were observed. I'm gonna go to the next slide there, Brian. So some of these components, and you do have a manual review. Like I said, you're looking at a camera, and you're also some facilities are using software assisted you know determinations that you know, might be able to get you closer. And that information could be fed back into a, a you know, uh, a process control, maybe. I, I don't know if I'm not aware of anyone using a software assisted video surveillance for process control to increase steam or air, but it could be utilized as a warning or an alarm to look to take action. Um, but, and, and we have actually had some of that stuff being incorporated into, uh, you know, a compliance solution as a, hey, I have almost now a four to 20 milliamp output that is indic indicative of visible emissions or not, and I'm going to record it just like I'm recording, you know, NHV or anything else. Majority, you got that, or you got the negative eye where you're looking right at the stack, but a lot of the video surveillance is going to be done manually. You know, you're going to be, you know, pulling or looking at certain, uh, you know, areas. One thing is if you have certain you know uh cons you know molecular weights and composition analysis you can determine whether or not you've exceeded your smokeless design capacity because you know there you need to look for excess emission or at night for uh, visible emissions because if you have visible emissions then you uh uh then you need to do some root cause analysis but the, the that's that's like just like a hey this is an area you've got to review further and ensure that you didn't have any versus, uh, hey, you have some with respect to visible emissions. Okay. So one th area that ties all of these things together is the CPMS monitoring plan. And the CPMS monitoring plan is a regulatory requirement and it kind of ties all of this stuff together. And it's really a starting point um, for those of you who may be first starting on this endeavor. I think one of the things that, you know, that we learn, uh, you know, through the refining, you know, aspects was let's utilize it, the flare monitoring plan as putting it together so we can build off of it and explore all the things we need to explore while we implement versus let's just put it together at the end and summarize everything that that that, that we have today uh, because what we were finding is when we got to the end we had to go back and revisit what was already done because maybe we necessarily didn't consider some things when we started getting into the details what type of monitoring equipment? Again, those are the system uh, design things. You want to know the accuracy that you need to you need to install your analyzers to. You need to know the quality assurance activities because you need to design systems to support the quality assurance activities, not only from the hardware,
but the software, the good data versus the bad data. And then the most important aspect of the CPMS monitoring plan from a regulatory requirement is no black box. You got to know what all your calculations are doing and you got to have them down. That's part of the CPMS plan. You've got to write down these algorithms or your decision trees or your thought process or your calculations in a transparent manner so you know what you're doing. Agencies are so sensitive now to, uh, I don't know what's happening. It goes in over here and comes out over there. And yeah, I'm going to have to get together with some somebody who programmed it. And that person may not be here anymore. So maybe we're going to have to recreate the logic. We just don't know what happens. We just know it does what it does. And and we, we can't define how it works. That's not what the intention of, of uh, you know, the regulatory agents are. They're like, no, we want you to know what you're doing for the for your compliance approach and then also by going through the flare monitoring plan it really ties into okay what am i what do i need to give back to a process controls you may have a completely separate system that's working in the background you know just doing environmental compliance and another system doing process controls or there's going to be a little bit of overlap in that and Going through the CPMS monitoring plan from a regulatory perspective helps define what that overlap is and helps define what the regulatory requirement is and how that, that uh, interlaces with the process controls. So that's the data, right? That's little nuances on the data. That's all the things we need to consider when we're taking the data and we're trying to show that we're, our flare is, is, is operating correctly. Now, what does the process look like when we want to put a system in? And it could be a data acquisition system. It could be you know, something you guys build on, you know, uh, on your site. It could be something that's, uh, uh, that's already been uh, you know, uh, demonstrated to be utilized at other flares and other facilities. It's a system and it has objectives, it has designs, but there's a lot of things and a lot of lessons that especially for those of you starting out that you need to start thinking about because they will be barriers. And they're barriers that we can foresee now because we just went through this with, within the refining sector for those folks who are just starting, you know, uh, you know, you know, with the EMAC or OD or MON. But what we're looking at is we're looking at infrastructure, integration, configuration, and implementation. We're going to touch on each one of each one of these, and Brian's going to share some of his experiences, you know, with some of the starting points, where they started, where they ended up, how they got there, and then where it is today. So I think going to start. I'm going to start. I'll just, I'll just take the purpose one, Brian, and you can come in on the. Uh, on, on the infrastructure. Again, understanding what the purpose is, knowing we need to know if you expect an environmental system to influence process controls, that is usually something that process controls doesn't like, but there is some feedback back and forth. There is some relationships between doing the calculations the same way, one for process controls, but not for compliance because we can't calculate things the same two different places for compliance. It's got to happen in one place. And then understanding what other things are going to happen outside of the, uh, uh, the compliance data. What am I using for record keeping? What am I using for reporting? How am I going to take the data that may be in a historian and utilize it to evaluate my compliance status so I can report things to the agency in a timely manner? So if we look at kind of the ideal configuration, and this is just in a perfect world, right? This is kind of where a lot of refineries started is they had spreadsheets and these spreadsheets were just accessing a historian. So the spreadsheet was something that an intern built 10 years ago that had, so that had you know, a lot of Excel uh, knowledge that takes, works real good in January, but in March, it takes 45 minutes for it to go out and grab the data and update. And, uh, you know, and no one kind of really understands what it does, right? 
that's where moving away from that and getting into more of an, uh, an ideal configuration where you're interjecting a compliance engine as part of information that's being fed to the DCS and then to the historian. So there's some, there's some you know, give and take on this. There's some different ways and different things of data going back and forth. It's not as simple as this picture, but what it's doing is interjecting one more step. It's interjecting another entity that it has a specific objective that complements the objective of a process control uh, you know, system. And Brian, you want to go ahead and start, you know, looking at some of those infrastructures and some of those, you know, aspects that uh, uh, that you've had yeah, experience I, with. Yeah, I'd, I'd say, you know, this, this, you know, when you first get started in the process of uh, check, double check, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me all right? Yep, loud and clear. Okay. Yep, <laughs> okay. good. So, I'm going to go ahead I'll interject real quick. We do have some questions coming in, so just just wanted to keep you guys apprised of that. So, which are good okay. questions? All right, awesome, Go great. Glad to hear. It. Keep them coming. So, uh, so, so this is Ryan. So, yeah, when we talk and we sit down and we start the process with folks, you know, once they determine that they're interested in putting something in, you start looking at infrastructures, and honestly, that tends to be outside of the understanding and interpreting the compliance and the approach to those different things. The infrastructure tends to be one of the next big hurdles to overcome and, and and a lot of that has to do with maybe there just isn't fiber or optics or connections uh, from different parts of the facilities. The facilities are generally very large and at the time they were put in maybe that, that wasn't even a consideration. So so then once you get the data pulling back to a central location, you then you start to, to work with the uh, IT security walls and fire and, and firewalls and, and things that are coming along and, and the various different data communication protocols whether it be Modbus or uh, analog signals or what have you, there's a lot of different communication. And so it's important to have this conversation early as you can, so you can start to understand, can I get that value that I need from that piece of information to build into the calculations? And so having this conversation about infrastructure is very important early on uh, when it comes to putting that together. Um, the, the big thing here is that, you know, like we talked about before, you've got the data flowing into the DAS, the DAS can still then feed the information depending on you know how you choose to do the, the compliance of it, whether it's feeding into the DCS and the controls purpose or whether the DCS does its own. But ultimately, we have all the information uh, flowing from that. When you take a deeper dive into the DAS itself, uh, there are a couple different approaches with this. Um, you have uh, and, and you know, working over the years um, with uh, power utilities and refineries and those, not everyone takes the same approach, and that's fine. And you know, we've learned an awful lot by going out in the field and talking to folks and understanding the infrastructure. And it's important, I would say, to look at this not as a one size fits all, but look at it from the point of view that you know each of your different sources, depending on the equipment you're doing and the process it's monitoring and what you're doing outside of the flares down the road, it can be a different approach in how you go about doing such a thing. You now, for example, you may have information that's only in, in the historian and you've got to pull stuff over OPC and pull that in to, to have a common plat a reporting platform, right? You may be pulling in stuff from the DCS over Modbus and pulling information in from that direction. That's also a possibility. But ultimately, laying out how it's set up and look at the different flares and understand the equipment that's involved and what infrastructure is there will go a long way to uh, you know, putting all this together. And then depending on your know, red circle here, that may represent our firewall and communication issues where uh, you've got to talk about, you know, you're going to get the no. They're going to say, no, we're not going to do that. We found that it's better off to start asking the question why after that and then working around that and we've learned a lot by how architectures and structures of security and policies and and being able to work with those groups to come up with a solution that 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 still satisfies their requirements which are valid um, and how we move forward with implementing a system that overall is going to help all the different groups the next piece of this is is really the integration and i'm, I'm going to start here and i'll let eric add to it uh, in a moment but you know Every system that has a successful installation has buy-in and has integration with these various different functional groups. When you sit down and, and you put a system in, 
in order for the installation and implementation to be successful, it's very important to make sure you include all the various departments and groups that potentially you'll cross paths with in terms of putting in a system because you have process control issues, you have infrastructure we've talked about, you've got operational folks that need to do day-to-day -day stuff with the system, and then how do you do those real-time alarms and notification that eventually feeds into the reporting. So having that, as Eric mentioned, that compliance um, CPMS monitoring plan and really thinking through how all these pieces will work together and having all the different parties involved will help ensure a, a successful uh, installation. Eric, is there anything else that you wanted to share on, on this topic? Yeah, the, the only thing with, you know, from our perspective, and you hit on a lot of them, but from an integration perspective is, you know, that's what do you, what do we want to do with this? You know, the, the system, where does it go? Where is it going to play? You know, because if we have visions of something that from the start the capability of the system or even the capability of getting data from one place or the other is not possible we want to know that up front we don't want to find out that data can't be you know transferred into a system over opc from a historian at the end of the project you know Agreed. because it could have yeah. shaped the way the project you know, uh, you know, started. So understanding how are the systems going to play together and how are they going to integrate and what's our ultimate objective, even if some of it's in the future, even if we're dreaming a little bit, you know, understanding what it could look like and what it may be able to do. So it's, we can take advantage of those aspects uh, once we consider all the limitations uh, or, you know, kind of what the sandbox is, if you will. Right. Yeah. It's because what we found is not everyone knows everything about everything out there. As you can imagine, there's quite a bit going on. So having the input from the various groups and understanding of those different functional responsibilities goes a long way to discovering stuff. It's very much of a, a you know, it research and discover and learn a lot about how things are flowing and where the information is and what you can go. Which then, of course, leads into the next piece that we're going to talk about, of course, is the configuration. Um, you know, I would say that you know, when we get to this stage, it, it, I think where we see customers struggling or clients struggling the most is determining that regulatory direction, because a lot of times, as we all, we all know, it depends is the, is the end answer. And so you have to understand what it means by and which, which approach you take from that standpoint. And a lot of our projects, unfortunately, get paused or held up at this stage when they're trying to figure out the final determination or who, who has the final say so of which approach to take when you're in, implementing a, a piece of that compliance or a calculation and such. There's a lot of different ways to do that. You all need to find the best way that meets the particular uh, requirements for your facility, how your facility operates and the different options that are out there. Um, and I will say that, you know, don't, again, not a one size fits all. You may look at each flare as, as their own unique uh, piece as they are and approach them differently because it makes sense. You know, getting input on that and, and adding that it goes a long way. And then the documentation with that goes and helps put things together. Eric, did you have something else? Yeah, I always have stuff to add, Brian. <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, yeah, this is regardless of of you know who's doing and who's putting together the monitoring solution, right? Is even if you're you know you have someone in process controls or automations doing it, they need to know from a regulatory perspective what to do, what assumptions do I need to make, what calculations do I need to occur, what ultimately do I need to use in the data. Uh, so I can generate or assess compliance status if that system is being designed, you know, in-house, or even if you're bringing in a third-party system to do that, they are not necessarily the ones that should make the decision for your facility. You're the owner, you should be driving that, and they should be part of the team. You know, hey, here's what we're doing other places, here's how we've approached it, why don't we do it this way? Here's what you want. Here's what we can provide. You know, all that, all that it should be part of the team associated with, uh, you know, pulling, uh, you know, those type of decisions together. And it really is a critical step because it puts people in a very, very good position uh, to succeed if they've got the roadmap. And the roadmap and all the little gray areas have been kind of decided on, agreed upon, and the path forwards outlined all the way to the reporting because process automation and process controls that's what they're going to be focused on 
environmental, just keep in mind, there's some reporting and record keeping reporting aspects that they're going to say, well, all the data is in his story and go ahead and use that data for reporting. Well, okay. Now we've got to figure something out here how to build that. Yeah, Eric, and I think I think one of the things and I believe you've said this in the past before, but when you have you have people that may not be as familiar with this type of area, they're more on the process side, or they're more understanding in different areas of their functional parts of the, the facility, but helping them understand the why will go a long way to bring them into understanding and it's like, oh, well, it's just environmental needs. I don't need to understand that. But if they understand the why, it may help them adopt and change and see why certain things has to have to happen a certain way because it's it's the requirements. But understanding the why and getting the buy-in early goes a long way, I think. All right, I think we'll move on. Now on the verification side, uh, this is kind of the, the end, right? This is when you take the system and you actually verify that it's that is correct and complete. So are the calculations done correctly? Do we get the alarms or notifications that we need to get to take action? Are the reports available to us so we can notify the agencies or report to the agency in a timely manner. So we're taking real data and we are evaluating that data to determine whether or not it's consistent with the configuration. We've already laid it out there in a configuration matrix that says we want it to work this way. Well, does it work that way? You're going to find it won't. It just won't. I mean, you were, you know, everyone's, you know, uh, you know, real good at what they do, but there's going to be things that need to be changed, things that need to be tweaked. And that's the objective of the exercise is to verify the completeness, verify that it's right. So you can have confidence that things are working correctly and as you envision them, because the next step. Yes is implementation so we, you can't throw a system out there on the implementation side that will lose credibility with those people you're expecting to have trust and faith in it so you know going through and you can train all you want but if the system is is providing bogus alarms if the system's not calculating things if the auto, the process automation is not working correctly, and the you know people are operating it in manual mode, and they or they don't believe the analyzer. You know all of those things in implementing. There's a high level of trust that erodes really, really fast. So by having that verification, it now puts you in a great you know position to implement. How do I train? How do I do this? in bite-sized pieces under an achieve, achievable schedules. What do, maybe I just start with the, the instrumentation folks. Let's roll out the instrumentation, the invalid data, the, unit, the calib failed calibrations, all the stuff that's associated with good data versus bad data. Maybe we can roll that out more successively within the, within the, uh, the ENI techs. Um, first, get those, you know, get that underway and then work on how you're going to implement things out in the operation side with respect to, uh, you know, you know, the, the system. And because ultimately as an integration step is how do you want the implementation to be delegated? In a perfect world, we would like things to be able to give people who are accountable for certain activities the tools that they can use. So if I'm an ENI technician and my responsibility is to keep my systems online and no good data from bad data, let's make that system function in a way that provides them a valuable tool that they can't, they don't, they don't know what they they were doing before they didn't have this tool. Right. So they are getting the data. They are knowing when the stuff is good and bad. They are knowing, you know, the percent uptime. They are knowing when they fail calibrate. They, they know all the stuff that they need to do to do their job. On the operations side, you, you've got the interlacing with process controls. 
But then you also got, well, when you do have a, a, a deviation from an operation limit, how's that handled? What actions do the operators take? How do they record, uh, acknowledge the alarm? What is that process? Making it very streamlined to get the most out of this is that we, of, of, you know, that we can. I think the only thing that I would uh, throw in there would be that, um, you know, when we go into these implementations, and unfortunately, sometimes either this phase or the phase before that, uh, in the configuration side, if we didn't do a, if there wasn't a thorough job done on the front end to really plan out everything, we start finding the gaps in this phase, and that also leads to, uh, you know, not buying into having a complete system or parts. So it's, again, reinforcing the fact that planning early on, if you've got time to get started with that, start sooner rather than later, because in the end, you end up having to redo stuff or start over. Or, or scrap plans and, and, and go back and sometimes that's just time and other times it's equipment and, and capital investment and such along those lines so find that ahead of time and get it done uh so that you don't stumble across or discover that in these phases as much as possible the other part that i would say those that adopt and move into this assuming they've you know been very thorough with this if you have somebody that's coming into this new again not as familiar with this type of process or don't understand what's going on having a very well defined uh standard operating procedure and approach to uh, here are my responsibilities here are my interactions whether it be daily monthly hourly whatever it is but well defined uh, standard scopes of work for those individuals goes a long way to understanding and knowing how to engage with a new system and and support their parts and i think in the end once they understand that they'll see the benefit of how it works and potentially it helps save them time and, and headache over overall uh, but being able to understand what their part is and how they play into that and then to the training, you know, there's a lot to take in. I would definitely encourage as much training as you can uh, and do it in different forms. I think a lot of us tend to adopt um, online training or, you know, online uh, different learning management systems that are out there to take training when, when you have uh, not available for the in-person training. Uh, although I will say that we are still seeing some people move in with that and that you can't replace that you know, from an in-person training perspective. But you know, going through a series of training phases and taking a little on at a time and build up to um, being ready to go when the time rolls out goes a long way for adoption, acceptance, and everyone's just happier about the whole process as it goes forward. All right, guys, hang in there with us. This is the last one, right, Eric? The last slide, yeah. So right. just to kind of, you know, I wanted to... Uh, just kind of regroup went over some of the highlights of uh, you know that that data collection and reduction you know you know challenges you know is we talked about the averaging periods and the cumulative nature of how we build these averages and understanding those averages and how they relate to environmental how they relate to process controls you may not use 15 minute block for process controls because at that point it's too late um, whereas environmental you are going to and then you, like we talked about the cumulative nature of those we talked about the regulated material and then also intermittent flaring i mean here you've got situations where what if i my flaring is not on all the time what if i flare for five minutes off for a couple minutes flare for two more minutes off for a couple minutes now epa just respond in response to comments to the ethylene mac gave a little more clarity around it um with respect to what they classify as a flaring event just came out you know uh you know last week so it's pretty consistent with the guidance that was already out there on intermittent flaring but it's something that i truthfully haven't got a chance to really get got my head around yet so i don't want to necessarily throw something out there yet if there's any little uh uh little nuance to to EPA's response, but it is something just came out uh, last week. Good versus bad data. Got to know good data, got to know bad data. Got to be able to distinguish those. How are you going to incorporate into the process, you know, integration? So I'm going to have regulatory defined data. It's not just, you know, that has quality assurance activity associated with it. What am I going to do and how am I going to incorporate that into my process loops and my process control strategy? How does that play into your compliance demonstration? What am I going to use? Remember, process controlling the process. I have another means to demonstrate compliance. I have a requirement to do that. They could be separate. And then what's that record keeping? What's that reporting look like? 
uh, associated with, you know, operating these flares uh, as they are intended to meet the the design requirements and the comb combustion efficiency and the the, the destruction efficiency uh, that EPA requires. I think with that, um, I know we had some questions, some polling questions. Maybe we can gear that up and we'll kind of switch gears here to um, uh, take a look at the questions and start answering there. Eric, have you looked through some of the ones that we have? Yep. We, we actually only had one, we have one question and uh, it is a yes or no question, but I'll expand. <laughs> uh, is PS9 does not apply to calorimeters? Correct. PS9 is only for GCs and mass spec, all right? However, calorimeters do have quality assurance activities that they're required to do. What type? Manufacturer recommendations. Where does that go? And your CPMS monitoring plan. What could that look like? There is documentation out there from you know, various different vendors that have frequencies for validations that they recommend and they will give you that in writing so it's not as complicated as ps9 but it still is uh, taking that analyzer offline to do these tests for a short period of time but you're still removing them from service to do the quality assurance activity at a weekly or quarterly basis depending on you know how you get the how the the manufacturer and how your QAQC plan, or sorry, how your site-specific monitoring plan for your CPMS monitoring plan, how it defines uh, those those actions. Hey, did you see? Um, by the way, there was a, a follow-up to that. Eric, did you see that? Randy, who asked that question about the PS9, he had kind of a follow-up there. I did not see that. Can you want you read it? I don't. See, it may, maybe yep, just. I'm not seeing it either. either. Yeah, so he says, along with that, why would a facility want to speciate with a GC or a MS other than detective work? Primarily, you know, uh, that, that's what they're doing is they're looking at process controls. Uh, where, where is it coming from? You know, what, what else can I learn from that? Uh, a, lot, a lot can be learned from the composition. Um, it also plays into some other reporting aspects. It may be required by a consent decree that I need to identify different individual components. It may be required by a local rule or uh, you know other other rules that they need to speciate and they need to identify certain criteria. So there's regulatory drivers and there's process uh, uh, you know process. Uh, you know, uh, you know, drivers as well, troubleshooting drivers. I guess, Eric, the only thing I would add to that is that, you know, we, we have seen and had to implement for clients before where they have to do both ways, right? Because they have to comply with the local agency or whatever the consent decree, whatever it was, right, that they had to comply with. But now the new rule coming up, they're making passes. And so that just makes it even more confusing sometimes for folks because you gotta, you've got to do it. You got to do all, all both of them. <laughs> the one thing I can say on the PS9, and I, I hit it in the presentation, be very, very careful if you are already doing something. If you already have a GC, if you already have a mass spec, and you think that I don't have to worry about it because I already got one and I'm already doing it because I have a consent decree, make sure you understand all the quality assurance activities in PS9 because most likely, you're only doing a subset or you're not doing that consistent with PS9 just because you may not be required to. You may not be required to do all of those tests. And uh, we have a couple more questions. Jennifer kind of has a similar question. She says, "What would a hydrogen analyzer used to calculate NHV be subject to PS9? And then she had a little bit of follow-up. She said, would you consider doing a webinar looking at flare camera footage and discuss what should be considered visible emissions where you know we're finding it's more subjective than than we expected yeah the second part of that question that would be interesting and uh yeah the the we are we were we're hearing a lot of that about that about, about the visible emissions what constitutes a visible emission 
And if you're looking at it from a method 22 perspective, it either is or it isn't, you know, so it's kind of, it would be a real interesting to determine, is there a threshold or because we're, if we're doing a method 22, it's either, is it present or isn't present? Uh, back to the first part of that question is, you know, calorimeters, you have an optional hydrogen uh, component because you want to take advantage of the BTU content credit, if you will, the hydrogen credit that you get associated with the BTU. If you're using just um, hydrogen, a GC just for hydrogen, whether or not you would say that the PS9, I, I would say no because, and I would have your plan be very clear about this, is that you are not doing component analysis. You're doing a, for your net heating value, you're use, utilizing um, your calorimeter. You are utilizing the GC as a hydrogen analyzer. The hydrogen analyzer is not subject to PS9 back in table 13, even though it's a GC. Just kind of went like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a few more questions. Um, uh, this one's from Zach. Are you required to report downtime from Max CC? No, no, there's no reporting requirement. However, you're, you need to know it. I mean, like a record keeping to know when the systems are are not functioning. It's going. It's interesting because you're not required to report it. I'm just assuming that we're going to start seeing some agencies asking for it, like. Uh, you know, did you have any downtime? What was your like during periods where if you're flaring, uh, you you wouldn't you wouldn't report any downtime, and thus you wouldn't be able to show any compliance status. So you're not required to report it. It seems like it's a little bit of a miss there with respect to what we're typically used to. If I have a monitoring system, I report that downtime. You need to you still need to know good data versus bad data, be able to quantify it. And even if it's from an internal record keeping, you know, perspective, but no reporting requirement. All right, good stuff. Um, another one was uh, uh, Stephen says, very good presentation. What system is best for HROV, HRVOC monitoring systems that have metals that interfere or clog probes? Wow. Yeah, I, I <laughs> don't know if. I would have to pull some other resources in to, to, to consider that, you know, there's a lot of s things that can go into, uh, you know, determining what's actually occurring. Is it occurring in the probe? Uh, so I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. I'm, I don't know that we have any answer. The, the, the person who asked that was like, wow, I'd be awesome. I was like, oh yeah, you know, you go out and buy one of these things down at Home Depot and put it in there and, you know, you're good to go, but unfortunately, it sounds like an engineering, uh, you know, problem for uh, those folks who, who who do a lot more of the hardware stuff. You may have seen some of those those issues before. I, I will say I've seen some interesting applications using GCs for uh, cooling tower monitoring for that very purpose, but I'm yeah, not so familiar with that one. But I would be interested to know because that sounds like a very interesting application, that's for sure. All right. Sorry we couldn't answer that one. That's all right. Can't get them all right. Uh, Stacy here says, thank you, Eric and Brian. Always great refreshing uh, me my memory with you guys. Um, so no question there, but she just I figured I'd read her good comments. Uh, Dan says, has there been any more clarification around VE and the five minute, two hour time frame rolling versus block? Well, any further clarification? No, but I'll give you my take on it. <laughs> Um, is that, and if you remember the requirement is they, there's an exemption there and the exemption says you can have five minutes in a two hour period, right? So it's two hour. You can go back and look at the definition of an hour and there is a definition of an hour in part 63 and it says starting on the, commencing on the beginning of the hour. However, the way I interpret it, is if I'm looking, if I'm doing a method 22, because that is the primary compliance, then they, they added the option for the camera. If I'm doing a method 22, it says, if you see something, extend your test run. 
I and I interpret that as if I'm visually seeing it, I see something. I'm extending 120 minutes. I'm not extending two clock hours. That's the way I. That's the way I. That's the way I interpret it, and then roll that into it being a 120 minute, you know, evaluation versus you know, a two clock hours. Because those are very different. <laughs> Gotcha. Um, let's see. Steven says, I uh, just want to add that the TCQ developed some very good flare operator training in conjunction with the University of Texas. Did you guys know that? No, TCQ is very active, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, awesome. they should because I think they have, I forget how many thousands of flares they have. So uh, <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. Wow. Uh, Dan had some more comments about the, the, the max CC. He said there is OOC calculations in the max CC, presumably for GC or MS. So, yeah, I think he was commenting on what we were talking about earlier there with max CC. Yes, there is. So there is, there is for, uh, what it, what it basically says is out of control is a regulatory defined threshold. So PS9 gives you a pass fail tolerance. It gives you pass fail. It doesn't give you out of control. Out of control is defined in CC. So I can fail a PS9 at 10%. I fail the test, but my data is not out of control until two times that because CC comes in and says out of control is two times, which is 20%. So there's two different thresholds. There is a failure. Failure and out of control are not the same thing. Failure means I failed. My data is still good. I just failed. Out of control is defined by CC and says, oh, I'm out. I failed and I'm out of control. My data is not any good. It's a good point. It's two, just, just, just two, just two, two you know, distinct things. Yeah, we've had a lot of conversation around that very topic. Hours and hours of fun, right? So. <laughs> Uh, a couple more questions are coming in. Um, Brian says, uh, and there might be a typo in here, but he says, if if you have a flare CMS, you may be subject, and then it's, it has T and J A. I'm not sure where that is. So then you would be required to submit monitor downtime. And he has a question mark on that. Yeah. Under so if you're subject to J A, and that that your total sulfur and your H2S, yes, but it's only for those two components. So even if you're using a mass spec, I mean, basically you treat it as Say you're using a mass spec or a GC for BTUs and the sulfur compounds. Two, they're different analyzers in, in, in the world of a regulatory perspective. I have different performance specifications, different ongoing quality assurance activities. Even though it's one analyzer, I treat them differently, and I and I would have downtime reports for JA, which would be which which is consistent. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Cool. Uh, Mike here. Um, he, he was kind of combining two uh, thoughts here, but for the TCEQ flare training was a 2009 study in collaboration with John Zink and the University of Texas that was referenced. He, I guess he was just commenting yeah, on there, that. There was a, there was a uh, you know, EPA and John Zink did a lot of work on you know, those performance indicators, what constitutes, you know, you know, good combustion, good performance of a flare came out of the, a lot of those, uh, those studies. I think that was, 2012, uh, 2012. Yeah, yeah. He he mentioned he referenced 2009, but maybe it's 2012. Uh, let's see. Michelle has high level question. Overall, do you see EPA leaning more towards block average periods for monitoring versus rolling average periods? Our state agency is pushing us to add rolling averages in our Title V, and we prefer block. Well, for this purpose, it's clear they're block. Right, and the blocks start and commence on the hour. Um, if we're, if you're extending, you know, states do this a lot. Is what is the regulatory authority? If you have a rule that specifically says do blocks, and they say we want you to do rolling because we believe that's more conservative, what is the regulatory uh, mechanism for doing that? Uh, and you can push you can push back on that because if they, you know, they would have to implement their own rule that would say 
and you know that we're going to require this because it's more we 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 deem it to be more stringent and I could I could it's math there's always going to be scenarios that you can show the rolling average may not be uh, you know more conservative than a than a uh, a block average if you're looking if it's undefined let's say you're just doing a three hour average and it's not anything to do with max CC and you were doing a three hour block and they want you to do a three hour roll and it's not defined anywhere. You know, that's one of the things about not having, you know, uh, definitive uh, mission standards that are out there that, you know, it does give the agency kind of the upper hand. The thing, the thing that you can go back to is look as how was the emission standard established? You know, sometimes, well, if that emission sta standard was established due to three one hour test runs, then I may be able to support a three hour block, you know, because I use stack testing to support it. So look at it, look at the genesis of it, figure out where it came from and see if you can, you know, you know, push back, but all but push back. What is the regulatory authority for them to, especially if they're deviating from a federal standard to, to do, to, uh, to ask for something different. Okay. Good. It is nice when they do define it, right? They don't always do that though. So. <laughs> yeah. And typically, if it's not defined, what we would recommend, if you have any permits out there where it doesn't say block or rolling, in your compliance certification, when you attest to the compliance, either continuous or intermittent, I would put it continuous or intermittent based on a three-hour block average. And just do that and continue to do and be very transparent, very clear, because if they come back four, five, six years from now and say, we want you to do rolling now, say, look, I've been doing this compliance demonstration and telling you in my Title V compliance cert of what I do. And now you're coming and telling me to change? I, I don't think so. And then try to get it rolled into your operating permit as kind of a hygiene and hopefully an administrative change, not a uh, something you have to go through a permitting exercise. Yeah, Excellent. another reason to have it well documented, right, in your compliance plans and your QAQC plans and have it all laid out. So you've got something to go back on. Well, it looks like we got one last question. I think we're uh, getting close to the, the two o'clock hour. So we've been on here for two hours. Just want to be mindful of everybody's time. But last question, uh, Stephen says, how is a flare DRE verified? How's a flare DRE verified? Well, what from an ongoing compliance perspective is there's, you know, you're we're doing these indicators, right? We're basically they've set standards that ensure that the DRE is verified. Now, if you're saying, how did they figure that out? There is a, um, a paper that may, I get my, hold on, I have it up here. Let's see here. And it's, it's, a, it's a parameters for properly designed operating flares. And it came out of OAQPS from EPA and it's in its uh, 2012. It goes through, it's an interesting read, but there are a lot of footnotes with a lot of PhDs and a lot of science that went into it because DRE on a flare, when the, the, the destruction would happen, what do you do? And there's no way to collect it on the backside. How do you test it? Right. And there were some pilot studies. There were some, you know, stoichiometric things. There were, there was, there's science that goes around it. If you want to know you know, kind of more, more about that, I would suggest, uh, you know, you know, you read that, but what they backed into is now that we know what we want to achieve, here's the subset of parameters that we want facilities to maintain to ensure that we're hitting that 98. And you can search for that on the, uh, uh, on the internet and it'll pop right up. Sounds like a great weekend read. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, good stuff. Um, I think we've thoroughly exhausted uh, everybody. I mean, the, you know, we're at the two o'clock hour, but um, but you guys got anything else to add or? Um... Yeah, I just appreciate everybody's time. Uh, hopefully, you uh, you got some value from this. And uh, as always, if, if there's any other questions or contact information, just reach out to either Brian or I, and we can. Uh, we can continue conversations if there's something that pops in your head afterwards.
Yeah, I think the only other thing that I would say is that, you know, if it's part of feedback on this, we'd, we'd like to know what next round or other topics and things. I think there's a couple suggestions today about things to dig into it. And so if you have any thoughts about what else you'd like to hear about, we'd love to hear that so we can roll this into it. Because it sounds like we might be doing this for a little while. Um, so maybe we can come up with some other topics. And I think we did have a, at least one polling question. Are we going to throw that one up here at the end? Is that the plan? Oh, that's right. My bad. My bad. Yep, I, that's right. It's so sorry, everybody. Yeah, let me let me dump those up there. Shoot. Almost forgot that. Uh, yeah, get some get some feedback here on on the polling questions. And and by the way, if you can't answer the question on your screen, if you minim we found if you minimize your screen, uh, your uh, the webinar a little bit, it'll give you that um, capability. So, uh, but yeah, you see the question there. What type of DAS systems are you currently using for data management? Looks like everybody's responding, which is good. Well, Eric, they don't give us an answer. What's up with that? Let's see. I think I can put this up on the screen as um as the results come in. I think so. Let's see. Without ending it. Yeah, that's what I was trying to figure out. Um, well, I thought so. Polling, um, yeah. So it looks like uh, like forty eight. About half of everybody said other, and then it's kind of split between Stack Vision and uh, the Microsoft Excel. Just a little bit of a few people said Cisco. Nobody said Vim Technologies though. Okay. And we so, have people left. Do we, do we have any? How many responses did we get? uh yeah we got about 70 percent of the people answered so that's good that's good so um let's see let me launch the next one here though and and get everybody's thoughts on that one last question what is your biggest data management challenge 15 minute block averages and providing documentation increasing quality control requirements Requirements for reporting and making data accessible, operational efficiency, or the lack of visibility into calculations. So select one. I'm guessing, uh, guys, we uh, these probably could have been like, you know, put them in order, right? <laughs> but I guess you're looking for the, the number one biggest data management challenge, right? Yeah, yeah, just to keep it simple, right? Yep. They all can be uh, challenging for different people, depending on the infrastructure, the system, the analyzers, the you know, equipment they're using, what what have you, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it looks like um, looks like everybody's pretty well. I mean, still still people are voting, but um, looks like the majority is uh, about 30, 30 plus percent is a lack of visibility into calculations. Then the next one's about 28% or so, 27% uh, requirements for reporting and making data accessible. Mm. And then yeah. about another 20% of increase in quality control requirements. And then uh, a, a few at operational efficiency and a few at the 15 minute block averages. Mm. So it looks like number one is the, the lack of visibility into calculations. Yeah. So, well, um, good stuff. Uh, thank you guys. I, again, I appreciate um, you guys taking the time to uh, to help us out here with with our air monitoring webinar series. And um, just a reminder, everybody, that tomorrow uh, we've got a kind of a follow up or part two to the air monitoring webinar series. And um, we've got two excellent speakers, uh, Jordan Lassiter and Brian Whitley. Uh, from Alliance Source Testing, Jordan's with Alliance Source Testing, and, and Brian is with EMSI, or uh, yeah, EMSI. But they're dealing with the niche app regulations that are specific for hazardous air emissions, and they cover extensive lists of compounds that may need to be tested for or considered as part of regulatory testing and monitoring. So um, these guys, we talk about the complexities, the method selections, and why there is not a one-size-fits-all approach to the HAP testing. So. So tune in tomorrow. Again, you should have the free discount code. Just put that in there. Uh, love to have you on tomorrow's webinar as well. So just go to our website 
and register the same way you did for today's. Well, uh, appreciate you guys, um, uh, Eric and, and Brian. Thanks so much. Thanks, Travis. We appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a great day.